Scott, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thanks for um, having me. I'm going to throw you some rapid fire questions. And I really think I know what you're going to answer this time. Well, <laughs> I might change some of my answers. Ooh, slippery. <laughs> All right, dogs or cats? Dogs. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Rolling Stones or Beatles? Rolling Stones. All right, so we're going to take this step further. What's your favorite Stones album? Uh, uh, not, to, not to put you on the spot. Yeah, that's tough. Um, you know, I that's a really tough one for me. I don't know if I can even answer that because I... So my father introduced me to the Rolling Stones at a young age. And so I actually enjoyed every single era. Okay. Which is rare. That's, that's, you know, but one thing about my father, we had a lot of differences, but he turned me on to Bob Seger, oh. Pink Floyd, Rolling Stones uh, at a very young age. And so, I mean, that was influencing, you know, how I felt about music before I even knew how I felt about music. Yeah. yeah. So really, you know, usually I'm pretty decisive about favorite albums and I'm not really on the Rolling Stones and then Led Zeppelin. I kind of uh, discovered on my own and again, can't really name a favorite album. Almost every other band you could probably say, and I would say, well, this is my favorite album, but those bands were for so many decades and eras, I enjoyed every single change they went through and every single different style. Uh, and they are, and they went through that. The Rolling Stones changed a lot over the years. You can't say that about a lot of, a lot of bands. No. Like I, I always looked at Bon Jovi. I was never a Bon Jovi fan, but I can imagine now the new bon jovi like most of these like bands are legacy bands now yeah they tore off of their old material sure. but bon jovi to their credit records albums i don't know if anyone listens to them but if so they I if they do um they're very adult contemporary now mm -hmm. so as a bon jovi if i were ever it had been a bon jovi fan i'd be like oh this is kind of a letdown i'll yeah. give you an example and i shouldn't say this but the mighty mighty Boston's huge fans of um i worked with them back in the day um and i, I don't know it's just fun music yeah. but they started off as a punk rock band and then it turned into like a ska thing which i love but now they kind of hit that bon jovi kind of thing where they're like adult contemporary ska and it's like no nah, i miss <laughs> where's the guitar like i miss that <laughs> Where's the screaming? They have yeah. a new coming out, new album coming out in June. I'm kind of crossing my fingers, but I heard the first song and it sounds like the other ones, the recent ones, like, ah. Uh. Well, I just remember when uh, Emotional Rescue came out. Yeah. Right? And I was just like, what is this? And now it's, I mean, actually, it just took me a minute to understand how the Stones had evolved and what they were trying to put out. And I mean, I loved it just as much as everything else. And now I find myself like seeking it and listening to it. I, I love all the different um, Rolling Stones genres. Um, I've been gravitating towards the older stuff like Sticky Fingers uh -huh. because it, the, the, the production and the mixing is so um, there's more space in the mix. Yeah. So you can, there's, you know, in the modern mixes with like, I'm, I'm trying to think not modern, these albums are still 20 something years old, but like steel wheels and, and voodoo or a, a voodoo something, right? Yeah. Voodoo lounge. Voodoo lounge. Um, it's a lot of production and it's kind of like yeah. the, the sound, the wall of sound yeah. with that older stuff, like sticky fingers, there's so much space and nuance in between the, the, the instruments and you can hear the mistakes. You can hear the pick touch the, the string and most importantly i absolutely love keith richards background vocals so on a song like dead flowers and you can hear him and he's not he's not perfect he's not in pitch but that's what makes it awesome and yeah, that stuff was super bluesy too right like much more so than later on yeah yeah you could, you could feel that uh heavy blues influence that 
you didn't feel in some of the stuff later on a little bit always yeah. but you really that older sticky fingers especially i think um and i love when you can hear the fingers sliding on the strings and the changing of the chords and all that yeah. i think less production in that rock music is better i've been listening to i don't know how you intake your music now um but I pay extra for that title music service that has master quality mm. recordings. Yeah. And I've been on a Rolling Stones kick and a, I, I, what serves me well, what I find sounds the best with those master quality again is, is our albums that were recorded 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, like Fleetwood Mac. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of Fleetwood Mac. I've been listening to a lot of um, like Crosby Steels and Nash in with that service because you can hear everything and you can hear the reverb off the drum and like it's it's amazing you if you close your eyes you feel like you're in the studio like it's the they say it's the closest thing to a master like listening to it off the master tapes and it's it's i it i don't know i i'm I, it's so awesome i don't know what else to say but i get excited about it my fur is going up in my arms <laughs> all right so coke or pepsi coke what do your restaurants have? Did you have like, how does that work? Do you have to make the decision of Coke or Pepsi? Are you allowed to have both or like, how does that work? I am. Uh, so we don't use the uh, syrup systems. You know, we do the uh, Mexican Coke in the bottles uh, club service. Okay. So most of the people who come to our restaurant and, and would like a soft drink kind of prefer that anyway. They don't use that syrup, the, you know, corn syrup. They use sugar. Okay. And so uh, we use those products, the Mexican Coke products in the, in the small retro bottles. Yeah. Those thick bottles. Mm -hmm. And so we things. made that decision consciously, you know, it's like, all right, do we install a gun with all these syrups and all this stuff? And it just didn't appeal to us in, for our restaurant. So there's something like small batch about it. Yeah, exactly. Instead of having this big, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Big boxes of concentrate, you know, and it's just not really our thing. And you know, you know, it to be if we're all honest with each other, it it whatever like restaurant Coke will never for, I don't know why or how, but it'll never be as good as McDonald's Coke. Yeah, they put something in there. There's something going on in there. There's some crack or something <laughs> we don't know about. Uh Beecher Mountains. Uh, I'm going to say mountains at this stage. Okay. Uh, PC or Mac? Mac. East or West Coast? Now, this is not where you live. This is if if I were to say, hey, you're going to spend the next year of your life in one of these two places. Money's not an object. Sure. Be go wherever you want to go. So I'm still going to stay East Coast. And, and there was a time in my life when I would have said West Coast, and I've been heavily influenced by the West Coast for sure. But yeah. uh, at this stage in my life, I'm very much into what's happening on the East Coast. So, yeah. Okay. So that decision that and you're, you're not too far from me. I'm in DC. You're in Raleigh, North Carolina. So not terribly South for right. me. Right. But so you're, your decision, I'm assuming when I say West Coast, you're thinking probably Southern California. Uh, right? No, because I lived in Northern California at one point in San Francisco. So I think okay. that area. And then, you know, I'm thinking, you know, Seattle and the whole thing. But The whole thing. Okay. Um, which is, they're all great. Those areas are all great. Yeah. There's no question. But, yeah. you know, and I have some loyalty to East Coast now. That I didn't used to have. I was. I used to be very geographically anonymous, is how I refer to myself. Right. <laughs> Never heard that before. That's um, how you. That's how you identify. I d identified uh, <laughs> as that for most of my adult life until I had a family, made roots, became part of a community and a region, and yeah. that's kind of what happens, right? And then you you you're invested. You you know I feel a part of something. Yeah. Here on the that East. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Kramer or Costanza? <laughs> Kramer. Superman or Batman? Batman. Why is that? Uh, because he's dark. Okay. Superman uh, is kind of like the, you know, to me, same as Rolling Stones or Beatles. The Rolling Stones had that dark, dangerous edge. I feel like Batman sort of has that. 
Um, Soundgarden had that for me in the uh, 90s. Yeah. They were darker. And uh, I have that. I have that dark, uh, those dark sort of corners and that, that uh, little bit of dark creativity in me. So Does I can, that also include like a dark sense of humor? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And when I say dark, I don't mean, you know, that I want to be, uh, uh, you know, hurting people or, or anything that dark. I mean, just um, uh, dark in a way that I can relate to Chris Cornell lyrics right. you know, and what's happening in his sort of little uh, dark world in his mind. So just for the record, you don't have anyone in your basement right now. Exactly. Okay. I want to make that clear. The police uh, might be listening. I don't know. There's dark. There are a lot of shades of dark, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Batman is dark and he's, you know, he's, he's dangerous and mysterious in a way that I don't get from Superman. Did you, um, did you see the new justice? League? Well, I say new, did you see Zach? Was it Zach Snyder's justice league? I didn't. Okay. I haven't. If you like dark, you would love that movie. Okay. You need to schedule like a pee break in the middle of it. It's four hours. <laughs> But um, I'm not a big comic guy. Like I, I, I grew up. I say, I, I, I remember having a couple like uh, Captain America comic books. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it was like Richie Rich for some reason. That's what I remember. But I don't have an affinity or a dedication to one or the other, like Marvel versus DC. Um, but that Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder's Justice League made me not ever want to watch another Marvel movie again. Yeah, it's too much, huh? Well, it's like once you watch this, which is dark, um, the Marvel movies seem very kind of like comic relief kind of superhero movies. And this, to me, um, and I know there's a whole sect of people out there who will disagree, um, it's it this was like what a superhero movie should be about you know it they a lot of character development a lot of just they took the funny out of it and it was just a really good movie and i kind of i wanted more you know i i grew up watching you probably did too like the justice league cartoon as a kid sure. with like the wonder twins and yeah yeah um so um, I, I yeah all of them yeah so not knowing i guess i always kind of had some feeling towards dc i didn't know that at the time but right anyway i had a comic book phase as a kid and collected daredevil was actually okay. the one that i liked and they made yeah. a daredevil movie but it didn't appeal to me like the comics did who's um, that is that uh marvel or dc i don't even remember yeah see I that's just, the thing like yeah, i don't even remember i just remember liking that character and again, it was someone who was dark and mysterious and, uh, and not, uh, well known. Yeah. I always liked that. It was mine that I, I knew about this guy, this yeah, it, not it's, everyone did. It's funny. We're not talking, this is not a political podcast. We're not going down that road, but this is what I'll say. I tend to steer away from conversations that are like politics, meaning they make you pick a side right. and like, like DC Marvel, who are you? And somehow that defines you. If you like Aquaman, right. this is something else. And it's like right. ridiculous, you know, are you, uh, I, I don't want to be, uh, a pigeonholed that way. I don't want to be yeah. placed in any boxes. Like, are you an early stones guy or a late stones guy? Like, I don't know. I just like, I, if I like the song, I like the song. Yeah, right. I don't get it. All right. Last one, Kardashians or Osbournes? Osbournes. I love Ozzy. I enjoyed the Osbournes. He's and great. I, I love Ozzy for a long, long time. Yeah. Favorite Ozzy Osbourne song? This might surprise you. Yeah. I think it's, uh, do you remember the song Crazy Babies? No. When he first got Zach Wild? Uh-uh. Look it up. I'm going to have to. That might be my favorite Zach Wild song. He's a wild man. If you don't follow him on Instagram, go do that right now. Who, Zach Wild? Yeah, he's just nuts. I don't think I do follow him, but I really loved his playing. When he hit the scene. Babyface. Yeah. Crazy Babies was the name of the song. And this guy was just a kid 
Yeah. He came out of nowhere and he was like the next Randy Rhodes, right? Like, I mean, yeah. not to compare, but he, we were, I was like, wow, this guy can play, right? Yeah. All right. So we have, we, okay. So we've talked privately about what you like to be called. Um, chef or restaurant tour let's let's revisit that real quick for the audience yeah but what's the difference first of all and what do you like to be referred to as well for years i was just chef and you know a chef is a title that you earn i think in my opinion through years of training and uh when you step into a leadership role and you are commanding a kitchen then you are chef. Yeah. And there are, there are a lot of accreditations and a lot of, you know, things that can get you that title. Uh, hotels and country clubs like to put the title all over their jackets and then they put some flair and, you know, all kinds of uh, accreditations. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not the route that I took, but uh, I think people call you chef. Uh, when you've earned the respect and you've earned that title through your craft and your leadership. And then as a restaurateur, um, that's a title that just sort of happened for me. You know, I was a chef first, um, but then decided that I wanted to be the chef of my own restaurants and start mm -hmm. my own company so that I could make my own rules to some degree. And, uh, that's how you become a restaurateur. Yeah. You don't have to be a chef to be a restaurateur. That's for sure. There are lots of great restaurateurs out there who are not. Chefs. Yeah. I know a handful of them and they've never worked in a kitchen. They just love food. And they're, you know, they're very, a lot of them very successful and they yeah. just, you know, they're not looking at it through the chef lens, but uh, necessarily, but uh, are just great at making restaurants. Yeah. So when did you pick up the food bug? Well, I learned that I picked it up early in life, but didn't realize it. And I think it was probably from, like a lot, you hear a lot of guys my age say this, well, you know, probably from my grandmother's cooking and my grandfather's garden. And my parents mm -hmm. gardened as well. And there was a lot of eating things like Swiss chard and, you know, perfect heirloom tomatoes at a very early age before they became, you know, uh, trendy um, products in, in the food world. I mean, I'm eating these things as I was a kid and liking them, liking them and eating them very simply with just a little salt or uh, a little vinegar. And so this is in Pennsylvania. It was in Pennsylvania. Yeah. A lot what of people part? Um, Northwestern Pennsylvania, just North of Pittsburgh. Okay. Pretty rural area. You know, we came from a small, I grew up in a small steel town. You know, there were no chefs there. Yeah. The idea of becoming a chef probably would, would have been laughable. You probably had like, um, fast food or like diet, like local diner kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, Mostly fast food. There was, there were some good Italian restaurants in town, some steakhouses, things like that. Yeah. Not, not nothing like what I would discover later after leaving there. Okay. But, but the food bug, the idea of really getting excited about food was always related to something fresh, something from the garden or like rhubarb pie that mm. my grandmother made, you know, eating these things as a child and liking them. Clearly I had the food bug because most kids wouldn't even touch Swiss chard. But so they, um, grew a lot of their own food, right? That's right. So that's like the, you know, you were eating farm to table before it was cool. That's hundred percent. So I, you know, I learned as an adult that that's really when I caught the food buzz, uh, the food bug, yeah. as, you, as you say, and, uh, didn't realize it at the time though, just knew that it was exciting. You know, when my grandmother sliced this tomato that my grandfather grew and you know these juices just flowing out of it and just with a little salt how magical it was when it was balanced and i knew the difference between one that was kind of flat on my palate and one that had the right amount of acidity and sugar you know you know natural sugar in it i mean i identified that at a, you know seven eight years old 
And you, I mean, so do you remember the taste more so than the like the visual of it, or just the experience altogether? The experience altogether. I, I remember both. Yeah. Um, seeing it and being so excited about it, and, and it was always something. My grandfather always had something, and my father and mother uh, had a garden too, but sh- for a shorter time. Yeah. They had a garden for a short time, and then you know careers took over and and things like that. But my grandfather always grew a great garden every single year. And he shared his vegetables with us, his family, his neighbors. That's just what he did. He grew more than he needed, way more than he needed. So he yeah. And then neighbors shared their things that they grew. And we got to try a lot of neat things. You know, one thing that COVID um, over the last year has taught, I don't say taught me, but like reminded me, um, we've always gravitated. To, I, I think we have a, I think I, I can only speak for myself. I think I have a, um, a balanced, I had a balanced upgrade upbringing. Um, I grew up minutes outside of Washington, DC in the suburbs. Um, I could be there in 10 minutes. Um, but my grandfather who lived less than a mile away had 20 acres and a, and a horse farm and grew his own food and we had a we had a um um actually half of our backyard was was uh like a garden so i grew up around that too but i grew up you know at their house all my grandparents house all the time and that was like you know that was big time you know yeah. he had the tractors and the this and the the you know the tillers and and then my my uncle lived in warsaw virginia the, um like the northern neck of virginia and he was a soybean farmer and at that time i didn't know i didn't, I didn't know what that meant like i didn't even know what a soybean was um now you hear about soy all the time but i just knew that i was you know i had times in my life where I grew up around tractors and dirt and plants and seeds and stuff. And looking back at it now, it's a great thing. You know, it, it, uh, there's something about growing your own food yeah. and you know, you don't have to, aside from the, like the, the pandemic stuff, you don't have to depend on anybody else, but there's something it's like catching your own food as well, like fishing or, or, or whatever. But, um, and we fished, we grew up fishing and hunting. Yeah. And we ate, everything that we caught or we hunted. We hunted. I loved, I love hunting pheasants and eating those and deer. And uh, so there were some lessons there that I was learning very early on that I didn't figure out until. When did you realize that those were l- actual lessons that you could apply? Like, this is what I want to do. And, Oh, wait a minute let me utilize some of that knowledge that I learned before that I didn't even realize I was intaking. Probably, you know, as I got very serious about cooking, then it becomes, you become very serious about your ingredients. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're just cooking and experimenting a little bit uh, and maybe working a job and learning the basic techniques of cooking and how a, a brigade works and a line works and all of that, that was fine. But then when I got serious about discovering what kind of food I wanted to put on a plate and deliver as my, my food, Mm -hmm. right. Then it became very much about the ingredients. And I was, as I was learning how to seek out those great ingredients, I realized that I had learned that at a very young age. Yeah. And so that sort of, you know, and then it became a farm to table kind of this term that you just was just, you know, ridiculously overused and became a marketing term. And uh, it really was just what we should have all been doing the whole time. Yeah. I don't understand this whole organic thing and farm to table thing. Cause it, that's just how life was. Right. And we changed that. Now all of a sudden we want to go back to that, which is the way we should have been all along Um, and grass fed. Like we, we, I try always to, to, to um, never buy non grass fed beef. I try just to eat all grass fed, you know, I'm reading enough things say that it's better for you and and things like that. But, um, and I can taste it. I, I feel like I, I can taste the difference, but that's just how it was before. Like it makes me laugh thinking of what have, 
you know, like, what have we done? And we, we're, we've gotten to a point where it's been, it's gotten so bad with the chemicals and everything that we got to, re- you know, make this major shift to go back to the way it was, even though it's now more expensive and it's, it's, it's ironic to me. It is ironic. And, and, you hear people make the defense, well, you know, we, we need to mass produce food to feed a population. But the fact of the matter, the chemicals used, the, the factory food, it, it's all for profit. It's not for, oh, yeah. because we have to feed, uh, you know, this, you know, this massive population. Um, we can do that with small farms. Yeah. We can. Um, but, to be competitive, and I do know some farmers who do conventional, and I know farmers who do, uh, you know, organic or sustainable. And convent to be competitive, a lot of them have had to shift to conventional, even though they didn't want to. Yeah, because it keeps the prices down because chemicals are cheaper, and so it's crazy that it's become so difficult for farmers to do things the right way. That's what's really sad. Yeah, to me. Um, when you're right, when, when I was a child, they were just doing it. They were just doing it. And then suddenly it became all about profit and convenience and, uh, you know, chemicals. And now to go back and do it the right way is double the cost. And unfortunately, even good farmers can't compete. It's sort of like the machinist in my town who used to machine everything in house for say some larger, uh, automated thing they were building. Now they have to have the machining done in China. They don't want to, Mm -hmm. but they have to, in order to compete in order to get the bid to to do the job Yeah, because it's cheaper to ship it to another country and have it machined than to do it right in their own. It's so interesting. It's It's so interesting. So, you know, it's kind of the same. I learned that too um, in that town. So So when did you decide this is what I want to do for a living? Uh, I was in my early twenties and, you know, I was doing it for a job. I, I got into the restaurant business as a bus boy, server, bartender. I kind of worked my way through the front of house first and was making quick, quick cash and living on the beach in Florida and having a good time and mostly partying. And, uh, I got into the kitchen sort of by accident when, when someone didn't show up one day, Mm -hmm. I was friends with all the cooks because uh, they were more my, the kind of guys I hung out with. Right. And so, you know, it was natural for them to say, Hey man, can you just work? Uh, This guy didn't show up. We can show you what to do. And so it was sort of an accidental entry into the kitchen. I said, sure. And I, I actually loved it. I mean, immediately just, was like, man, this is amazing. And, and I could make more money serving and bartending, but I actually chose to make that shift because I felt more at home in the kitchen. And just the adrenaline of that was uh, addictive for me. Um, and then there was this craft. There was something that I could do with my hands. And I think that's in my DNA. Yeah, I think that's why I myself leaned or, or have – a. I enjoy cooking because what I do for a living, you know, editing and producing video and content, um, you start with nothing, right? And you have these ingredients, i.e. a piece of music or a graphic or a video or um, some audio bit, I don't know, whatever. And you have to make it into something. Well, food's the same way. And it's that, it's, I don't want to call it a journey, but it's that kind of challenge of doing that and there's nuances and there's well if i do that first then it's going to change what happens down the road and and layers and i just it's fascinating to me what i wonder is 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 in any level or on any level um do you think you enjoy what you do because of the memory that you had with your grandparents and you know your your discovering it for the first time and those memories and feelings and, and that, that you shared earlier. Is there like a connection there? Yeah. Oh, there's definitely a connection. I mean, there's no question that every, every year in tomato season, I'm reminded of childhood memories and and 
most people are, and they don't, just don't even realize it. But there's a reason why they like certain dishes because it evokes a memory. Sure. Uh, beyond just, you know, that they enjoy the flavor, but it, it, you know, music and food can instantly take you back to a moment in your life. Yeah. And you're, it's like you're there, like it instantly. Music and food both do that for me and for most people. Yeah. So there's no question that there's a connection there. Um, and just being able to transport back to that moment. I mean, that's pretty magical. It yeah. is. It's pretty magical. There aren't many things that can just instantly do that for you. And sometimes it's not even the smell of the food or the visual of the food. It's for me, it's like reading it off of, off a menu. We were at a restaurant, a new restaurant that we hadn't been to last week. And I saw fried green tomatoes on it. And up here in DC, I don't know. You just don't see that quite often. And as soon as I read that, it took me back to my childhood dinner table where I don't, it, I am so odd. And maybe you can explain this. I can't eat like I love tomatoes in the form of fresh salsa. I make it all the time or um, I'm trying to think like I'll make fresh uh, 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 sauce, you know, Um, but I can't I I won't eat it on something. It's for me. It's like disgusting on a cheeseburger or, you know, any other application salad or anything. I always have to get taken off, but. Like, I don't understand that if I eat it raw in the form of a salsa, but I won't have it on my cheeseburger. But as a child, I felt the same way, but my mother would make fried green tomatoes and there's something, I don't know. I, I, I loved it. So yeah. even just seeing it on the menu sent me back to, I remember, I mean, I, like I visualized what she wore that day and what I like, it was weird. Like we're all sitting at like what order all my siblings were sitting at the table. It just really takes you back. I mean, like you're there. And yeah. I, again, that is a magical, magical thing. And yeah. music can do it. I'll be in the car and some song will come on from when I was 14 years old. Man, I am there. And I have butterflies because of some girl I like. And I'm, I mean, it's just like you're there again. Yeah. Wow. You know, we, we had that. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just, I think it's more common than you may think. Tomatoes yeah. are very textural, you know, and so there are people who like the flavor of them, but as it, like maybe just a sliced tomato, they just take issue with that texture being on a sandwich or whatever, but they do like salsa and sauce and all the derivatives. I didn't realize what you were just talking about until I had kids because I just didn't think about texture and food before. And then they're the exact same way. I had a conversation with my son last night, nine years old, and he, I forgot what it was now, but he wouldn't, he didn't like it. And it was literally the same thing that I cooked him the day before. But for some reason he said the texture on this one's different and I don't like it. Kids are a real thing. In fact, the, the childhood palate I think is much more sensitive to texture than the adult palate. So yeah, they, they have issues with texture and my cousin, I remember growing up, I couldn't understand. He, he hated tomatoes. Um, And I think he hated every, pretty much everything, maybe pasta sauce he was okay with, but I just could not fathom that. I could not get my head around why someone would hate tomatoes. I don't understand my brother and he'll probably be listening to this. He'll, he, eats cheese on pizza but that's it yeah won't eat a quesadilla uh (laughs) cheese sandwich grilled cheese nothing like and i can't get an answer out of him as to why that is well Uh, it could be just you know uh a textural thing again and that's a specific you know cheese is very specific on pizza yeah but yeah, I think it comes down to texture. Well, the cool thing about experiencing food and music is you don't have to go to school to know what you like. You don't have to be a record producer or go to chef school to have an opinion and have it move you. You know, it can, I mean, you're. T- we're both talking about how food moved us as children. And I think that's beautiful. You know, it's anyone can enjoy food. That's right. And music. For and music. Matter. Yeah. So you mentioned um, partying and things like that. Did you get caught up in the restaurant life 
uh, the, well, the, the, the working at a restaurant life where it's working nonstop, you talked about that adrenaline, especially in the back of a kitchen. And then, you know, I've, I've been sitting at a bar long enough. We're meeting friends in that industry that it's just the party starts after they get the shifts over. Sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, to say I got caught up in it is not, is an understatement. You know, I actually joined the industry because I was a wild man. I was a, you know, I partied like a rock star and that was part of who I was. And that was an industry that I could do that in mm -hmm. and still succeed and thrive. And, uh, it was almost expected because if you didn't want to go out, you were kind of like, Oh, you know, Scott's yeah. going out tonight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was strange. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it just wasn't, uh, there weren't very many people, you know, who weren't hard partiers in the yeah. back then. This was the, you know, the nineties. <clears throat> How bad did it get? Well, it got bad. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in recovery. I've been in recovery for 16 years. I was, yeah. uh, uh, as about as bad as someone gets eventually, but mm -hmm. you know, my crash and burn happened, um, with, from a combination of things. And that is, you know, alcoholism, drug abuse, stress, uh, self-medicating for that stress, self-medicating for, you know, trauma from childhood. Uh, and then, you know, what happens is you, you, your body skips in, right? So my mind was <clears throat> giving in long before my body did, but when your body does, it's like, oh, wow. I could yeah. actually die. I might actually die. So that that's where I was. I was going to die. So to answer your question, it, it, it got pretty bad for me. Do you feel that that's a common thread or a common experience within that industry? Of my generation? Yes. Yeah. Not, not, so you own two restaurants now. We'll, we'll dive into that in a bit, but do you like, so now it's different now, nowadays? It is. It's, it's changing. Um, there's certainly still uh, some element of that, but uh, we are headed in a much more positive direction as a industry. And we're recognizing the mental health issues and the addiction mm. and alcoholism issues that have plagued our industry. And we want to be a better industry. Most of us um, want to leave the industry better than we found it. And so we're taking steps and, uh, also, you know, it's just a, a bigger industry in our country than it was when I got into it. Mm. And so if you're a bigger industry and you want to grow up and be a serious industry and be taken seriously, um, then you have to improve so you can attract talent. Back that, then, let me just tell you this yeah. quickly. Back then, it was sort of a, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, transient sort of industry you came in maybe you worked during college or it wasn't a real job mm -hmm. that's what it wasn't it's a real job now i mean i have servers who uh have bought homes and had very good lifestyles and flexible schedules and families and uh they were very happy and it's sustainable did, did does that did that change or have anything to do with the idea of the celebrity chef? Meaning there you could take it even further than you thought of just being a great chef in that town or that re particular restaurant that the you had more opportunity because it's now to work in a restaurant or to be a chef. It's cool. Like it's yeah. a cool gig now. Yeah, it is a cool gig now. It was not a cool gig when I got into it. Yeah. It was uh, very blue collar. Yeah. Very, very uh, hard. And we were, you know, sort of pirates, sort of, you know, degenerates, you know. Uh, I saw that all sort of change. I went through that change. And uh, yeah, really the only limits now, if you, enter into this industry, decide to be a, whether you decide to be a restaurateur or a chef, the only limits are the ones you put on yourself. Yeah. Because you can do whatever 
you want. Um, if you're willing to put in the work and learn and, and, and go for it, you can, have, you can make, you know, a hundred million dollars a year, like Wolfgang Puck mm-hmm. or, you know, uh, be happy as a executive chef of a country club. And yeah. that's the cool thing about being a chef. That there's so many avenues that you can. Yeah. Do. I, um, I love the documentary about Shep Gordon, uh, Supermensch. Have you seen that? I haven't. I've heard a lot about it. Okay. I did not realize that he basically invented the celebrity chef um, by putting Emeril. Emeril was his client and putting him on camera. And the original deal was that the Food Network was a brand new thing. And he was repping all these chefs because, he, and, and uh, uh, forgive me for not um there, he became friends with one chef, a, a world famous chef, and now I can't remember his name, but um, we'll put it in the show notes. But the chef basically confided in Shep, like these, you know, I'm getting hired for these cooking gigs, but no one, they're not paying us. That's like a common thing in the industry. And he kind of took that upon himself to kind of write that ship. And once he realized that they, they are marketable and they, they were products themselves. So he made the deal with Emerald of, Hey, Food Network, um, he'll work for free, but he gets all of the rights if he wants to sell things in the grocery stores. And then boom, there you have the celebrity chef. And it's just, you know, you can, any chef can be that. I mean, with, with like, um, I forget the names of the shows, but like in DC, we have, I don't know. We have a handful of chefs that were on Top Chef or or um, those those kind of competitive cooking shows, and they're now they have you know five to ten restaurants under the belt now, and they're doing really really well. It's a cool thing. Um, so when you had mentioned substance abuse in the restaurant industry, is there a um, organization that focuses on getting those people help? There are now, yeah. Um... And one was founded by uh, two very good friends of mine, friends of mine, um, Mickey Bax and Steve Palmer, out of Charleston, South Carolina. And it's called Ben's Friends. And we have a chapter here in Raleigh. And there are chapters, uh, you know, their goal is to be in every state. And I think, you know, at this point, they're approaching 20 cities. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mickey has been a mentor of mine for years since I got sober 16 years ago. And he's, you know, over 30 years sober and stayed in the industry and, you know, set the example of this is how you do it. And so what Steve and Mickey set out to do was say, uh, you can be in this industry, you can be sober. And also if you're struggling, here are some things that you can do. And here's a support group and meetings that we're going to, Uh, have. And so it gave some structure and almost like a blueprint for those who are in the industry who are struggling, who don't want to leave the industry, um, but maybe don't see how they can be sober in the industry, which was the case with me when I first got sober. It was not, I just couldn't imagine being sober in this industry, but you can. And as a chef that has two restaurants, do you feel a responsibility of, of, you know, guiding this crop, this generation of, of restaurant employee, uh, restaurant employees, for lack of a better term, um, you know, to let them know that there are options and you can do this. I do. You know, when you become a chef or a restaurateur, you become a role model and people are looking to you to teach them how to operate, how to cook, how to uh, be good leaders, good managers. And there are, you know, so teaching them good habits uh, from the beginning for how to deal with stress. What I was taught when I was coming up is you dealt with stress by drinking after work. Mm. Um, If I had been taught something different, maybe I would have explored something different. Maybe not. Again, I like the party, but that's one of our goals is to just teach people different methods, you know, whether it be exercise, nutrition, uh, massage, uh, chiropractic, there are a lot of things that we sort of teach, uh, people within our organization about that can help them be healthy Mm -hmm. physically and mentally and deal with stress 
in ways other than, you know, just throwing back some drinks after work. But it's just about, it's just about guiding them and teaching them and, and being a good example, I think. So this leads to my next question that may be taboo. I don't know. But, you know, obviously though, there are those in the community that, and I was this way at one point in my life, that utilize restaurants and bars to do that thing that you're talking about, to relieve stress and to get that out of their system. Does re- Do like restaurants have a responsibility, I mean, to those in the community outside of not over serving? Like how does, how does that relationship work where, I, I, I guess I don't know where this is going, but like, is there a relationship with the restaurant owner and someone that they may suspect? I don't know. I don't. Well, do we have a responsibility? The, the, the responsibility that we have is not to serve intoxicated people. Okay. Right. So whether that's over serving someone, maybe they came in intoxicated and we didn't serve them at all. Yeah. It's not just over serving them. It's just a matter of understanding if people are okay when they walk through the door, which, you know, kind of back in the day, we, we didn't think too much about now we're very aware of that because we do have people who come in, especially for late reservations who are intoxicated and, so beyond that, though, a good example, I think, would be of having two or three great, I mean, great and creative spirit-free cocktails on the menu at all times. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to feel any way if you don't want to drink. You can yeah. still enjoy a cocktail with your friends. And you can order it by name, and nobody else at the table even knows that it's spirit-free. So... It just says it on the menu. Um, I think that's a great thing. And, and by the way, we sell a lot of them because maybe it's a Tuesday night and someone has to work the next day. They have meetings or something. They don't, they don't want to be foggy. And so that, but they normally drink, but they can have something that's equally satisfying sure. without the, dealing with, you know, any sort of hangover. Well, maybe how, do you, how do you handle being around a bar as someone that's in recovery? Well, for me now, it doesn't bother me. It never really did because I, I had made my mind up that I was done drinking and I really was going to do any, everything that it took to, to stay that way and be healthy. But um, for a long time, I couldn't, you know, I didn't want to smell wine. I didn't want to, you know, smell cocktails. And now I do. I use my nose a lot, as a matter of fact. In fact, I can taste wine and spit it out without any desire to drink. And I don't know if it would have always been that way, but after 16 years, yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, well, not- one, last, one last question on this subject. What is it? Your oldest child is 13? 13, yeah. 13. What does it mean to you that you sobered up prior to having your children? So they only know you as they know you. Well, I mean, it means the world. My wife and my children have never seen me take a drink. Yeah. And so they know me as this person and I may not be fully formed yet, but I'm someone who very much wants to be the best husband and father that I can be. And I want to be a good businessman. I want to be a good human being and I'm flawed far from perfect, but I'm working always and asking, am I being a good human being here when I make choices. And so that's, that's what they're learning from me. And kids are watching everything yeah. we do. My kids know about Ben's friends meetings. They've helped me make coffee and snacks for these meetings before they know that I help people. They know that I've struggled with alcohol. And we've talked about that because they're going to be offered these things. Mm-hmm. And I want them to know that they're, they're you know, that the dangers of it and that, that I struggled with it for longer than I probably needed to. And I hope that they make better choices than I did. So we, we have, we've had those conversations yeah. and we continue to have them. That's great. I mean, I, I think that's how you have to approach it. Honestly, I have an, I had an interesting relationship with alcohol. My one side of the family, a lot of them were alcoholics um, in and out of jail due to alcohol related issues. 
Um, and I always kind of looked at that as I don't want to be that way. My dad's dad was, it's always, it's, it's always struck me as funny how they referred to him. He, my grandfather wasn't an alcoholic, but my dad's dad was, mm. he cleaned up somewhere in the middle. So yeah. I never, I never knew him as an alcoholic. He was just, you know, I never saw him drink. Yeah. Um, but my dad had some horrific experiences living through that. And we never had alcohol in the house. Um, growing up and, you know, having gone through some trauma, you know, post 17, there were two times in my life that I felt myself drinking for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be that person that had to quit because I enjoy having a, a drink here and there. Sure. So I, I consider myself one of the lucky ones that was able to kind of understand that, notice that and, um, react to it accordingly and just kind of go, okay, let me pump the brakes here. Cause I don't want to go down that road. And I have learned to have a very healthy relationship with it now. So my kids, I mean, they may see me have a drink a month um, if that, but it's a, um, we have a healthy relationship about it. We talk about it. Um, not daddy's, you know, but just oh, oh, what a healthy relationship with anything is. And, you know, it's what I find is you can have an addiction to anything. You can have an addiction to shopping. You can have an addiction to working out. You can have an addiction to eating healthy. Um, what I tell my kids is, is that if you have to do something to fill a hole in your life, where regardless of what it is, that's a problem. And, you know, pump the brakes before okay. it gets too bad. Yeah. Exactly. You should look at that and, and analyze that and, and uh, yeah, react accordingly. Yeah. So you bounced around in the back of a house. When did you become like, when did you become the chef at the restaurant? So I think there were some defining moments for me. I uh, got, had an opportunity. I'd been cooking in Florida for years and I graduated from a cooking school with, you know, an associate's degree, a basic cooking degree, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I learned some things from that degree and, I, and it opened some doors for me. So it was a positive thing. But uh, after that, I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco. And that was sort of a, even though I wasn't there long, I learned a lot in a very short period of time and learned, and it, it, it took my understanding of cooking and restaurants to a new level and the way that food was approached there and um, produce and products were respected and, and handled. That was a kind of a defining moment for me. But after that, uh, I came back to the East coast and I joined the Ritz Carlton hotel company. And that company taught me what it meant to be a chef as a leader. Mm. And so I'm bringing into that equation, the things that I learned cooking in Northern California and the way that they approached food and ingredients and then learning leadership from a company like the Ritz Carlton, uh, that was a pretty good combination. And so that was probably, you know, when I was given, uh, I was, you know, appointed um, the chef of a fine dining restaurant within the Ritz Carlton hotel company. That was a pretty big deal at that time. Yeah. And that was a, that was a defining moment for me. Well, when did you make the jump uh, to owning a restaurant? When, when did you become a restaurateur and why? So I did, you know, I worked in hotels after the Ritz Carlton. I went to a Relay at Chateau property and I worked through the Forbes five star accolades and, you know, focused on the, the, you know, just the highest level of excellence that I could possibly achieve. And, but what was happening is, you know, to achieve these accolades, these Forbes five star and, you know, it was triple A five diamond and all these accolades that, that were given out, um, even some James Beard nominations, the, the payoff there was, you know, I'm getting this attention and I'm, and I'm earning these accolades and I'm learning, but I'm working in a hotel where I have to work on Christmas morning and Easter and Mother's Day and every single holiday, I was just completely uh, immersed in my work. And so the holiday season would come and everyone would be, you know, people outside the industry or 
you know, experiencing joy and family time. And I was experiencing misery and exhaustion and weight loss and, you know, just hating it. Um, and two, you know, it wasn't fair to my wife because even though I was doing good work, she was almost like a single mom at home with the kids, you know, and I was mm -hmm. providing a lifestyle, which I, I was proud that I could provide for my family, but I was absent. And that's what really made me decide I needed to start my own company mm. and, and make my own restaurants where I could own my time. I wanted to own my time. I didn't want anyone else owning me. I learned, I did a personality, uh, uh, one of these personality uh, things you fill out, you know, and I learned through that, that I, I have issues with people owning me. <laughs> <laughs> my wife kind of pokes fun at me about it. Uh, and so if, so if I feel like someone owns my time uh, and I have to ask permission at this stage in my life to spend time with my family, mm -hmm. that was an issue for me. Yeah. So also hotels, you know, had a lot of sort of standards where, you know, I had to cover my tattoos. I had to be someone that I really wasn't kind of hide my true self. Yeah. I couldn't talk about my addiction publicly. I couldn't talk about my recovery publicly because I was part of someone else's brand. It was a sterile environment, I would assume. Sterile. Now, it, it, so we've all been to hotels and resorts. Would you say that the menu is there's as a chef, there's less, you have less creative freedom to. No. There's always some irrelevant washed up hotel manager redlining your menu right. when you're in a hotel, which again, I took issue with yeah. naturally. I mean, my personality is not going to just like, this is what we're serving. This is what you're making. Be happy. You know, with there's there are all these layers of ridiculous management and committees within hotels that keep things from actually getting done. Yeah and make uh, red tape. And when you get too many opinions in a menu and you actually try to please everyone all the time, it's a recipe for disaster. Wait a minute. Are we talking about the restaurant business or the government? <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's a recipe for disaster. When yeah. you actually think that you can please all the people all the time. Oh, yeah. It's impossible. So you do what you do. And my opinion was, look, let me do what I do and do it very well. And I think we'll be appreciated by most. And that's the way to go. But again, hotels have these layers of management. It was, yeah. So there's always someone, typically some hotel general manager who thinks they know about food, redlining your menu and yeah. having put things on the menu that are just completely irrelevant in today's food world. And you're just kind of like, yeah, I think, I think it's time that I. So what was it like to make that jump and go off on your own? Was that was scary? scary? Was that yeah, exciting? Was I'll tell you why it was scary because I had a family Yeah. and uh, you can fail. So you will fail. Yeah. There's a good chance that you can go out there and have the best intentions and be very talented and still fail. Lots of people do it. So I knew, but I have the best wife. My wife said, you know, if we fail, we fail, then you can always go back to hotels. You know, you can always go back to restaurants that other people own. And that was encouraging for me because I didn't have a spouse saying, oh, I don't know, this is too scary at this point. We like your salary. I had a spouse saying, you need to do this because you'll never forgive yourself if you don't do it. Yeah, she was right. That's that, important. That, it's important. It, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made that leap without her support. Yeah. Um, and in you fact, and I, same situation for me. I, I was a production manager for fortune 500 companies that had media wings and I, same thing. Like I had some guy that didn't know anything about anything telling me what, and it drove me nuts. And they wanted us to wear certain clothes. And I'm like, I'm not wearing like, no, this is like, nobody wants to have a creative dude come to the, come to the meeting looking like that. They want it to look like, you know, sleeves and tat, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's just, so I get, I, I get that. I get it. Yeah. You know? well, but my wife was music, great. Yeah. In, in music, 
you have the, the business side of it stifling the artists constantly and telling them what to write. And I'm yeah. sorry, I, uh, I wanted to hear about your wife. You said she was very supportive. Same thing. She knew what was inside of me and knew that I would regret it and knew that I would probably be better served, you know, that way. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you. I'm wired to be the creative guy and I had to learn how to run business and still learning. Um, even all these years later, cause my brain's not wired for that. My brain's wired for the creative side. Do you find that to be an issue at all? I think I'm very fortunate in that. I also enjoy business. I really, okay. I rather be creative and would rather spend most of my time being creative but I seem to be able to go back and forth pretty fluidly yeah. uh, between the right and the left brain. And I think I'm very fortunate in that respect. I like to get systems in place and I'm pretty good at establishing those systems so that I can spend most of my time being creative. So what has been your favorite mistake that you made starting these two restaurants that led to your biggest success? My favorite mistake. Your favorite mistake. Well, there's certainly been a lot of them. Um, like if you had one mistake that you thought was just going to end things, but ended up being a blessing in disguise. What comes to mind is, is I thought it was a mistake to sort of let go and allow the people that I surrounded myself with to be to be part of the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a mistake, by the way. But in the beginning, I thought that that might be a mistake. So if you're thinking, well, what was that? That was what I thought at the time was a mistake, ended up become, helping me become more successful. Yeah. By allowing you know, people, it didn't have to be, the brand didn't have to be just me. It's all of us. And allowing my people to be, to be part of my brand mm -hmm. was something that in the beginning, it was just, I, I was stretched too thin, especially with opening the second restaurant. Uh, the menus at both places don't have to be an expression of me. These are restaurants naturally that are an expression of me. They're named after my family, but I also hired very good chefs to work under me who have, some amazing ideas and talent. And so the best work that I've done has been since I actually began to, to let go and allow people, you know, I don't, the last thing I want to be is that guy redlining people's stuff. If it's good. Now I get to edit it and I get to have the last, you know, sort of word, but I'll even try things that I have, you know, maybe some, reservations about and they end up being fantastic and top selling dishes mm -hmm. so that's been a really really cool uh growth opportunity for me and, and uh, an evolution for me is there a struggle to create food you know to take the to take the music analogy you know a musician some musicians write music that they think the audience is going to like. Right. But there's other more times than not. Well, I shouldn't say that, but then there's another set of musicians that make it. And if they like it, they make it for themselves. And if the audience likes it, great, but that's not why they're making it. How does that translate as a chef? That's such a cool analogy because so for us, the menu would be like an album, right? And so on that album, or on that menu, we're going to have some dishes that we just want to do that we like. And that's that. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe a little bit, you know, not your crowd pleaser, but those can end up being some amazing dishes that are popular. But we also have some things on there that we just know people are going to order, you know, uh, and then we, we do what we call sort of our treatment to it. The treatment that makes, that gives it that tilt. And we call that tilt, you kind of tilt your head, not in a confused way, but in a excited way. Like when you're tasting something, like I knew I was going to like that because it's pork. Yeah. 
man, that, there's something going on there and I can't quite identify it. And so we can take something that we know people are going to order and still put our treatment to it that satisfies our need to be creative as long as it makes sense. You know, and I think the more you mature as a chef, the more you know what makes sense and what really is just doing, you know, we're not really into smoke and mirrors or a lot of drama in our food where we're at and at these restaurants, but uh, we still like to surprise people with pleasant you know, interesting surprises. Yeah. So the other thing that I've always wanted to, to ask a chef, um, so I love cooking and my goal is to, whatever it is, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or even a snack, I want to make restaurant quality food for my family. And it m- meant the world to me a couple of weeks ago, my, we had steak and uh, I, I've, I mean, I've taken 10 years to figure out finally how to make, in my opinion, a great steak. And my daughter looks at me and says to the table, wow, we have a personal chef that lives in the house, which was awesome. Yeah. But I make food that I like. How do you make food that you literally don't like the taste of an ingredient? How do you know if it's good or not? Or how do you like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, sure. Like, how does that work? First of all, let me address the title that was bestowed upon you by your daughter, because earlier we talked about how do you get that chef title? Yeah. And remember, I said, I think it's best when it's given to you by someone else. You did say that. So you were given that title by your daughter because you earned it, because you worked on establishing and cooking restaurant quality food in your house. So I think that's pretty cool. I just wanted to comment on that. I'm going to go out and get my, my uh, chef coat now. And you get the tall hat. Now. Ah! The second part to that was, um, what was the second part to that? Like, how do you make food? How do you know if something's good right. if you hate that ingredient and literally don't like the taste of it? Well, the good thing for me, I'm pretty fortunate in that I don't hate any ingredients. I, I don't. Oh, wow. There's not, I mean, I can't even name anything that I dislike. Like squash? You like squash? I love it. Cauliflower? Love it. All right, you're nuts. I'm not. <laughs> I am. I just love it. And maybe there were things along the way maybe I didn't love, but I was always a true believer and maybe it's possible. I just haven't had it the right way. And so I would continue to All right. try. And, and, you know, that's part of my job though, too. So if you don't like cauliflower, it's not part of your job. It's part of my job to figure out how I like cauliflower. Like I watch these judges on these cooking shows and I call BS on it all the time because it's like, how could you possibly like everything? Cause they act like they do. Right. Yeah. And it's like, I'm looking at these meals going like I struggle going to these uppity restaurant. I'll give you a great example. Um, we have some great restaurants in DC and just outside of DC, yeah. but like, I don't like going to the restaurants that like, you know, they take a great burger, but then they throw all this crap on the burger just to make it sound fancy. I don't, I don't want an egg on a burger. Right. Um, I just want a burger okay. or like a kale Caesar salad. No, I want a Caesar salad, not with kale like yeah. that. I can't, I can't work with that. And like these like fancy, like small plate things that are like that big and you're paying $300 and I've done those, but I just, what's on those plates nine times out of 10. It's like, I can't jive with that. Yeah. Like, well, there are trends, there are food trends. And so we as chefs sometimes play into those maybe sometimes more than we should. And there are chefs that do it well, you know, like, there are trendy ingredients that we'll, we'll, we'll say, okay, we're, we're game. We'll, we'll play with that ingredient because it's trendy and people want to see it and they ask about it. So, all right, we'll, we'll play into that. But then, of course, we get to put our creative treatment to that. Yeah. And uh, so we, we play into that a little bit. But I get what you're saying. You know, um, it can get a little bit ridiculous. Well, I tell you what, I'll tell you one story that I was frightened to eat dinner. I I was visiting friends in Detroit not too long ago, and they took me to a a restaurant. I think it's called Apparatus. I think it was an old fire station. It's a really cool place. And they were like, we really, really, really want to have the chef experience with you. We've done it once. It was great. And I, and inside I'm like, I don't want to disappoint them, but like that, that frightens me because the chef's going to go nuts. And I said, all right, here's the deal. 
because I originally said, nah, let's just not do You guys can do that. Uh, and I, I saw that they like disappointed them. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a big boy. I'm going to put my big boy pants on. And I said, there's one, there's one role. I just don't want like salmon. I don't like salmon. Can, can yeah. we stay away from that kind of stuff? And it was one of the best dinners I've ever had in my life. And it was wow. maybe a 10 course kind of deal. And I ate stuff that I never thought I would eat before. And it was awesome. So the lesson of the story retrospectively is I just need to be a big boy when I go to some of these places. Well, let me make this point though. You may have a 10 course dinner at one restaurant and you're just like, eh, you know, that fell flat for me. That just didn't do it. Yeah. So it's about really having things done well. Again, to my point I made a few minutes ago, um, and that is, you know, learning what chefs you really like, I think. I've had lots of 10-course meals that really didn't live up to the cost of them. Yeah. I've had some 10-course meals that were almost life-changing for me. Yeah. Really. It just happened to be what the chef was cooking. I don't know. The stars aligned. Yep. And a lot of times it's just the, a specific chef style of cooking that, that reaches, you know, that sort of I connect with. Well, so bef- I think it's important, Before it's important we- to have, have yeah. things really done well, whether it's a Caesar salad or a 15 course tasting menu, you know? Yeah. Well, before we move past cooking, let's, what are these two restaurants that you own? I own Crawford and Son, which is the flagship. We opened that first. And, uh, you know, then we, we had that open about three years. Great American restaurant. So this is a very okay. American restaurant, um, uh, sort of masculine in design with, you know, blacks and grays and dark wood and uh, with some clean lines, um, cool design. And then, you know, my daughter said to me, because it's called Crawford and Son, my daughter said, hey, you know, uh, what's up with that? <laughs> she, I think at the time she was seven or eight. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, there's a plan. Don't worry. And her name's Jolie. And we went to Paris as a family and came back, you know, and we dined at all these amazing neighborhood French bistros. And my daughter fell in love with Paris. She cried when we had to come home. She didn't want to leave. And so when we got back, the space next door to Crawford and Son became available and we grabbed it. And we made a little French bistro called Jolie. And so we have Crawford and Son and Jolie right next to each other. And it's very different in design. It's very uh, light and airy and whites and golds and, you know, just a completely polar opposite of Crawford and Son, yet they sit right next door to each other. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, sort of like this neighborhood or cult following in in both spots. And And they're different. So we have some crossover in guests, but we have some people who just are regulars at Jolie and some are just regulars at Crawford. So it's really interesting. What does it mean to the kids to have restaurants essentially well, named you know, after them? I think them? it's pretty neat because, you know, I'll be in the local paper or they, they will be, they've been in, my son and I were on the cover of a local magazine and we were sitting having ice cream somewhere and we got recognized because they were sitting on a rack. Uh, so it's kind of surreal. You know, the kids are like, these people are like, hey, you guys are on the cover of that. And it's just a local thing, right? It's yeah. not like it's not like we're famous, but they think we're famous. You know, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I know they're going to look back at that and just, you know, be so proud of that. And, and their and teachers at school good. come to our restaurants and, you know, the people that are in their lives. Yeah enjoy their coaches and have you been able to leverage like more playing time for the kids or better grades with these restaurants <laughs> no not really I mean, right. they still have to earn oh um, that whole earning thing we, we, um all right we've danced around this for for this whole entire conversation but we're the same age and we grew up on the same music and we both agree that there's a connection in a in a in a synergy um, of music and food. Um, and we kind of just kind of touched on that again with the, you know, the, 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 it depends on the chef and it depends on, you know, and I kind of, as you were saying that I'm thinking, yeah, it depends on where that band was in that moment when they recorded the album and where they recorded the album and what tools they had at their disposal, i.e. guitars and look at what you have behind you. Yes. So what role of music, what role does music play in your life 
and in the kitchen. So music has always been important to me since I can remember. And again, I think I was just turned on to some really good music at a very young age. Because even before, you know, I remember even my mom listening to Elvis Presley and uh, the Bee Gees. And then it was, you know, all the Stones and the uh, Pink Floyd and all of these other bands that my father was into. I just learned to appreciate good music mm -hmm. because it was put in front of me. And so then I decided what I was going to consider good music and got into music of my own. And it was just always there. It was just always a really important part of my life. And in the kitchen, it was extremely important. Um, not as much now. We're not, you know, we're, we don't listen to music as much unless it's sort of an off day. But the way music uh, supports me now is that after a stressful day, and we have plenty of them, I can come into this room and I can sort of look at that wall behind me and sort of look around this room and decide, all right, well, what am I going to play tonight? You know, what, what music do I want to play? What guitar do I want to play? Each one of those is tuned differently. They all have a different sound. You know, they all sound completely different pretty much. And it, it's a complete escape for me. And I just get lost in it. I get lost in this world. Just maybe I might be just learning some new riff or learning some new scale or solo or something. And I'm just, the stress is just gone. It's just, it happens so organically that I no longer am thinking about whatever was stressing me out when I walked into this room. And so just imagine how amazing that is and how music has evolved as, as what it's meant to me over the years, mm -hmm. you know? So what, how is that similar to cooking? Do you get the same vibe and the same escape when, when maybe not in a restaurant, but when you're home and I find that when I'm cooking, it's like it, it things slow down and get quiet, even though if it's chaotic and there's kids screaming or there's video games around the corner, or we have people over, it just things quiet and slow down for me. So one of my favorite parallels between cooking and music I was watching uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were being in, inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And I was watching it. And I remember Flea getting up there. And he, he said some, very, some things that made me feel very emotional. One of the things that he said was, when I'm in the groove, like truly in that groove, it's the only time I'm truly free. And it resonated with me and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. You know, Flea is just an amazing musician and such an amazing guy. He was so right. And so, you know, it's rare that you're really truly in that zone. But when you are with cooking, for me especially, I am free at that moment, just totally and 100% completely practicing my craft at the highest level. And it's a freedom it's a f mental freedom yeah. that I also get when I'm deeply after probably an hour of playing and deeply into some, some song, I, I experience the same thing. Yeah. That's probably my favorite parallel between cooking and music, that freedom that you can achieve. Mentally. And it's, it's so eerily similar. Those two things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's what you're saying. I can speak for myself. It's it's very, very similar. I think the only difference is when I grab... Well, so let me go back a second. When you said you, you come home from a stressful day and you look at those guitars in the background, is it fair to say that what you're really asking yourself is not what do I want to play, but what do I have to say right now? Yeah. Cause that's, I feel that all the time. Like, what am I feeling? What do I have to say? And, you know, we may not be good with words. We may not want to have a conversation with someone else or ourselves, but like you pick up one of those in the back, one of those in your back and it, it, it whatever you're feeling, if you, if you're doing it for the right reason, it comes out, you know? It does. Yeah. And it just, you're right. I may not want to go vent to my wife or, you know, unload on her about my day. I may just, yeah. you know, use this language 
and and maybe I want to play some Metallica and just kind of go off for a little while, or yep. you know, maybe I want to play something more intellectual and difficult that will, uh, you know. But you're right; it is. It's about I'm definitely communicating through that. All right, putting you on the spot, uh, your top five guitar players. Oh, top five. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this will determine if we stay friends or not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, Eddie Van Halen is in the top five. I'm going to name five, but I'm not necessarily going to put them one, two, or three. Okay, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Because that's very difficult, and I think that would be unfair. Um, so Eddie Van Halen, for sure. Can we, can, we just, well, can we agree, though, that he's probably number one? He's probably the greatest of our time, sure. Yeah, okay. okay. We can agree on that. I just have to – we'll just have that as our as – our, uh, that's or, pretty. T- that's pretty tough to question. Yeah, yeah, he could, I mean, he he influenced everyone of our time, right? But you know, Jimmy Page. Yep. For me, uh, uh, Kim Thiel from Soundgarden. Mm-hmm. For me, personally, three completely different guitar players. Hundred percent completely different. Although I sort of view Soundgarden as the Led Zeppelin of the grunge era, mm-hmm. but that's just my opinion. Um, he, he, he touched me. He reached me that, and I met him and, and he was amazing. Um, Steve Vai was someone that I really, you know, I think is one of the greatest of our time, although he's more, he's just like so out there, right. That <clears throat> he's not commercially as successful as some, although he had a good I, I have an opinion as to why, but you have one more to list. Well, he's weird, right. But, Anyway, here I'll let you finish, but I have a very okay. definitive reason as to why. So, and and some people may agree or disagree with this, but Slash. Oh, he's got heart. Slash has heart, and, and uh, when welcomed or not welcomed, but uh, Appetite for Destruction when it mm-hmm. dropped in 1987, it was it was life-changing for me in that we were all sick of Barbie rock and everything was the same and choreographed. And here came these guys and just blew it all up. Right. And his playing is truly very, very good. Oh yeah. Um, Now I think they became overproduced later as you, right. And I think that's what ruined the band besides the personalities, but (laughs) (laughs) truly I saw him a couple of years ago, just get up there and I saw him, you know, I said, well, let me go see him again because I saw him back in the day. And he just got up there for three hours and never missed a note. I mean, just he sounds better than he's ever sounded. Uh, so Slash is there too. So that's that's probably my top five. And man, we could go on and on and on. There's so many greats. But of my era, of my time, those are five. We, share, we share three, I think. Cool. Yeah. Um, here's my idea with... Um, the slashes and not slashes, the Steve Vai's and the Satriani's of the world. There's two kinds of guitar players. And I think I've mentioned this in another podcast episode, but there's the technical classically trained. They know the variants of the chords and the, this and the, that and the overs and the, and then there's the guys that play it from their heart and they don't know how to read music and they don't know. I mean, they just play. Right. Slash is in that category of just playing. Yeah. Eddie Van Halen is clearly in that. He wrote the book of just kind of winging it. Yeah. Um, I would put Paige in there. Yeah. But those two specifically, Satriani and Vi, in my opinion, I know right away. So when people say, and this was my favorite part about Van Halen, was right before the show started. And you hear this if you're really listening to the albums, because the whole album's like this. But Right before the show starts, the lights go down and you hear this noise, right? And the squealings and the, sh- the shrills and just that, you know, you know, it's him. Like any, any Van Halen song, you know, that's him. Like there's no right. the tone, the finger, everything. Everything. I have the same kind of thing with Satriani and Vi, but it's not necessarily a good thing where okay. it's like, I don't feel the heart in their playing in the soul. I feel the look when, when, Especially with Vi, 
when you're doing all this and showing that you're doing all this and you have a fan hitting you and your fretboard lights up, it's like, oh, come on, dude, just play. Um, Satriani a lot less than that, but like, you know, big, being a big Van Halen fan, and there's there's my baby right there. Um, when Sammy and Mike started that chicken foot band with Satriani and Chad Smith from the Peppers. That's right. It was all I had, right? And it was kind of like, you know, I can't have them in Van Halen, but I'll have to live with this. Yeah. I it was still that Satriani didn't gel with it, you know. I didn't it didn't speak to me like like a slash or a that. Yeah. I, so to me, it's those two. I lean more towards the feeling it players versus the so, like classically trained guys. I agree. I think the the stuff that. Um, and, and Vi keeps coming up in, in my conversations because in the 80s, he was someone that was outside of the normal rock. And so he came out with this uh, passion and warfare. This, I think his solo stuff that he did, yeah. not with David Lee Roth or whatever, was, was more soul and heart, like you're talking about. Whereas Roth, when he was playing with Roth, it was all about look what I can do. And, yeah. and he was a performer, right? He was a performer. In fact, you look at those old videos and you just, just kind of like, really Roth after Van Halen. So I assume you're a Hagar fan more. So with Van Halen, you know, I got so much crap. I, we recently did an interview with sunset sound and, um, you know, they recorded their first five albums there and there's so much history there. And, um, I got so much crap for saying that. And yes, I, I knew of Van Halen prior to 1986, but when 5150 came out, it just changed my, that album changed my life. Life changing. And, and that guitar specific, not, that's not his, but it's a copy of his chain. You know that, but I'm telling everybody watching um, changed my life. And yeah. for me, Hagar's lyrics meant something to me. Yeah. You know, they weren't like goofy, like, Ross was, yeah. um, for the most part. Um, yeah. And Hagar, Hagar was a musician. You know, he could yeah, sing he, the phone he, book. He was a guitar player. Yeah. And he, um, I like his vocals better than David Lee Roth, honestly. Yeah. Where I got in trouble was criticizing Roth's vocals. And let me clarify. On record, I I'm a Van Halen fan, so I don't like. Although I lean towards the Hagar stuff, I love it all. Right. And again, before this podcast, I was listening to. Well, this answers the question. I was listening on YouTube, um, Van old Van Halen with the vocals removed. So there, there you go, <laughs> which is great because you can hear all the little things in the, in the right. space. But um, yeah, where I got in trouble was I was really referring to his vocals being utterly crap live because he like it's so bad live the last three tours were just unwatchable but i watched it because like i called it like audio like audio green screen i was able to like take him out of it while i was there um but yeah i'm a, I'm a hagar guy yeah i am too i saw roth for the uh, skyscraper tour back in so you did see that was 86 yeah no 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 that was Edom and you're right you're right it was like yep. 88, maybe a couple yeah. years ago, came yep. out skyscraper. And uh, I went, I went to watch Steve Vai play guitar. And then Steve Vai played for White Snake on he a did. tour back then. An yeah. album. So that's what I'm talking about. He played on the album where they did Deeper the Love. Yeah. And you can hear him without reading the liner notes like oh that's that's got to be steve vai right did he yeah. was he in white snake that has to be steve vai and i love that i love vai in the form of a in a form of a band yeah he's in a band mm -hmm. i like him a lot more when he has the structure of a song to work and play with yeah. when he's it's doing the solo bad. stuff it just i don't it, it doesn't jive it's it. weird his solo stuff is very sort of strange but yeah I'm it kind of leans back to his time with zappa it reminds me a lot of that and that's a little bit too, for me, that's just not my style. Yeah. I will say that I, I'm glad that I made a nod to him in my top five because he, you know, he, he's part of that whole shredder culture. But to me at the top of that, but most of the guitar players that I just uh, 
listed, as you know, are all like heart and soul players, Mm -hmm. not technical players. So clearly that's more of an influence on me. Yeah. And, and, And would, it's definitely more of how I cook. Yeah. Yeah. The same. I, I, you know I, what? So here we go. There's people that cook and there's people that go off the recipes. That's right. And measure everything. Right. I don't measure anything. You and know, I, and we never, I never did before. I'm starting to do it now only because it's a good tool for teaching. Yeah. Not that I want to teach people how to follow a recipe. I want to teach them. Uh, but I want to teach them how to cook and how to feel it. But your clientele expects the same meal and yeah. that that's where it becomes important. Exactly. So, uh, but for years and years and years, I didn't document anything. I mean, nothing. Yeah. So you want to talk about musicians who would, you know, write everything down or those who just remembered it. I was the guy who just would remember it or I'd do it completely different the next time. All right. So before we wrap this up, I have one last question in regards to the connection of music and, and uh, cooking. You had mentioned when you were in your wild days, you were living a rock star life. Do you feel like you acted out a little bit just to get that rock star life because you weren't a, like a famous musician? Probably. Cause I mean, I've been there. I've been there. There was a time in my life when I thought it might be cool to pursue music. Um, not that I'm at that level, but uh, I thought about it. So yeah. I clearly viewed myself as a rock star before I was a rock star. Chef. Sometimes I would ask myself, what would Alex Van Halen do right now? <laughs> <laughs> and that always got me this close to being arrested. Um, all right. So real quick, what do we have back there? So I've got a, a Gibson Les Paul studio. I've got this uh, Paul Reed Smith CE with uh, Maple. Is that Nash. Floyd? Is that a Floyd? Yeah, on that? It's a Floyd, yeah. which I'm not. I'm not a huge Floyd guy. Yeah. Um, but I have versatility in these guitars, right? So I have lots of fixed bridges. So I thought, you know what? And there aren't that many Paul Reed Smiths with Floyd. So there's a few. Yeah. So I got this interesting combination. Um, and that's the CE. It is. Yeah. All right. So that was made in my home state extremely extremely well-built guitar all right so we'll wrap this up before we have any more crazy technical difficulties all right um where can everybody uh reach you on social media well first of all what role has media played with you building your restaurants well media and social media have played a huge role for me uh I work with a publicist who's helped me tell my story and, and reach, you know, my community. And, uh, those, those channels are all very important in in my brand. And how, where can we find you and your restaurants on social media? Uh, so Crawford and son, uh, on Instagram is at Crawford and son. Okay. Uh, and then Jolie restaurant, and then Chef Scott Crawford. So those are my three handles f- on Instagram. And, uh, you know, uh, we're active on Facebook as well, but Instagram's our favorite. So that's where you'll find most of uh, yeah. most of our activity. It's so visual. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming on. I've really um, enjoyed talking with you. Awesome. And then we're going to make a trip down to Raleigh and uh, go to both restaurants. We'll do know. one for lunch, one for dinner. That'd be amazing. And then hopefully we can maybe look at some guitars. <laughs> I think that, hey, there's a shop here that you would enjoy. It's it's a sort of a higher end, you know, lots of custom things, uh, older things, you know, sort of um, boutique kind of guitar shop here that okay. you would enjoy. I would take, I could take you there. We could look. All at right, some so this is what we'll do. I need your wife to entertain my wife and uh, kids. The kids will play. The wives will talk, and you and I will go on a guitar safari. We have a pool here at the house, and the done. Kids- yeah, I mean that's where the kids hang out. It's we have this outdoor living space. It's like a little haven. Your uh, family will love it. So they can do that, and we'll sneak off to the guitar shop, <laughs> and Done. then we and then we could cook them dinner. Well, there you go. I would, you know what? I would love that. So there you, you could teach you could teach me a few things. I would really enjoy that. Honestly, I, I told you before. I am I am. It's embarrassing to say I am. I love my knife collection. Good for you. Yeah. I have um, 
you know, and now I'm embarrassed to tell you the maker of it, but I got them at Sir Latab. I heard that's how you say it. Yeah. And uh, they are Damascus steel. So I have a line of really cool Damascus steel Japanese chef knives. It makes cooking more fun when you have the right tools. It right? does. It does. It took me a long time to get there to figure out that that's the case because I was just yeah. hacking away at really yeah. crappy knives. And It's it, a lot more fun when you have the right tools. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. And I look forward to coming down and, and hanging out. Thank you very much. I look All forward right. to seeing you. All right. All right.